democracy enter into the table. Um, but then who knows where it will go. Um, as I said earlier, this, this whole idea of how scripture is written and the, the things that are opening up to us <laughs> at the moment um, give some wonderful insights into how the writers were thinking sometimes that with our western heads on we don't see sometimes and I started in the beginning of 1 Corinthians because that's a good place to start when you're looking at Corinthians and the first chiasm that I stumbled across um, I, won't, I won't go into all this stuff. I haven't got the illustrations and the, the, the bits because at four in the morning I had no computer. I didn't have the resources available to uh, start preparing stuff like I did last week. But um, safe to say this, you know, you know the passage that's really quite well known about wisdom in the beginning of 1 Corinthians where it says that the God's wisdom is not the way of the world's wisdom. And actually, as you read through it, you realise that it mentions a number of those things twice at opposite ends of the passage, and you think, oh, I hadn't realised that before, because we just read it through in a logical Western mindset. <coughs> Let me just hone in on the middle verse, in the, 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 the one that's the, the, the Paul in writing. Uh, and I think it's so clever, because he's, he's writing to a bunch uh, of um, Gentiles in Corinth who have come into the church and they've royally messed a lot of stuff up, haven't they? they, they I mean, they, they, they're into some really quite off-the-wall stuff. If that was happening in this local church, we'd probably be shocked at what they got up to. <laughs> and, and yet, God's speaking to them and and I also love that he begins by saying um, in, in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, he says, To the church of Corinth, God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. Paul keeps doing this throughout scripture. He calls them holy. That's, that's his first... You know how, how the modern age struggles with identity and what they're called what people tell them that they are. Well, Paul begins by saying to this complete hodgepodge of messed up people, God calls you holy. That's a pretty good start, isn't it? You know, even in your dilemmas, even in your sin state and the stuff that you're going through, God sees you holy. That's a good start, isn't it? Yes. So, yes. Church of Wellington, and specifically Life Central, you are holy. You are set apart. You are called into that. It's good news, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Let's wear that identity. And he kind of goes into this discourse about the, um, the wisdom uh, that God has for us. It's completely different to the way the world thinks. And this is very much speaking to the Greek mind. And, and uh, the Greek way of thinking in the day. And he's, he's talking about that. In verse 22 he says, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. So the, he's, he's kind of uh, speaking to both groups. And then a little bit later he says, Jews, um, there's a stumbling block for the Jews and foolishness for the Gentiles. And in the middle, and this is, this is the, the, the absolute centre of this. And, and actually uh, I was reading at silly o'clock this morning, that, that uh, this is one of the ones where it's actually in poetry. So Paul has written in the Greek words in sets of seven words at a time. He does, it, it, it's a bit complicated. He, he does a, an A, B, A, C, D, E, D, C, A, B, A. Uh, yeah, that, that, that kind of thing in, in the pattern. Um, and it's really, really clever how he does verses of... of, of of seven letters, uh, not letters, seven words in the Greek, then 14, then seven, then 21, and then seven, and then another seven, and then back to 21. And, and you see what I mean? He's, he's, he's trying to, in his Jewishness, draw in the Hebrews to see the chiasm in the middle 
So on the one hand, he's saying to the Greeks, you need to sort out this wisdom thing because you don't get it. You've got to trust in God. And at the same time, he's got the subliminal messages going on to the Jews that are reading this in, in Corinth. And, and, and they're going, well, where's, where's the, 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 the gem in the middle? And the middle verse is verse 23. We preach Christ crucified. That is the gem that Paul wants the church to hold on to. Isn't that good? Yeah. So all this wisdom is great. And, and God's got a different way of understanding wisdom. But he's saying, you Jews who are ta- bringing the message that we have got to the Gentiles, don't lose what you're called to do. Preach Christ crucified without his sacrifice it means nothing. Amen? Yeah. So that was my first discovery in Corinthians. It's like, oh, there's some of this amazing stuff going on once again. So the passage that I was intending to uh, bring this morning is 1 Corinthians 11, which is quite a wrap on the knuckles for, um, <laughs> for, for those who were around at the time. And uh, we'll start uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, 17. And I'll read it through, and then we'll go to the heart of the matter on this one as well. It says, In the following directives, I have no praise for you, if your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have been differences among you um, to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, It is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. And as a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of Christ. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. For those who eat and drink uh, out of... Sorry, for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning in regard to, with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, we are judged by the, this way by the Lord. We are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned in the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who's hungry should have something at home so that when you meet together, you may not result in judgment. And when I come, I'll give you further directions. (coughs) Lots to think on, but I'm not going to speak on a whole bunch of it. I'm going to go straight to the heart of it. The middle verse. In, even though there is rebuke, there is correction and instruction in this passage, isn't there? And each of us will kind of take on what we need to take on as we read that through. But the middle verse, the verse in all the things that bounce around with the way that the chiastic system works is verse 26. And it says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
with his Jewish mind. He's saying, this is the heart of the matter. All the other stuff is important peripherals. But the important bit is, every time we get around this table, we do this for two reasons. Because it's a proclamation of what he did for us. It's, it's what we had in, the, in that first chapter. Christ crucified. And we hold on to that. Because in and through that, we have... We are saved, right? And there is a non... It, we are being <coughs> saved. Is that there's an ongoing thing, the Lord's death, until what? Until he comes. So there's a, a now and a not yet. This is a something that we are going to continually be being saved, as it says elsewhere in Scripture. We have this amazing thing that's happened, and you know that in, in, in the way that I've spoken over the years, this isn't the only bit of scripture that's pertaining to our walk with the Lord. I'm not into penal substitutionary atonement, as they call the fancy thing, which is Christ died in my place to appease God's wrath. That's not what it's saying. So he chose a relationship with us to put himself in that place because he loves us so much. He loves his bride. Amen? Do you all understand that? Yeah. Does that, does that make sense? Because it's so important that we don't just think that there's an angry God with a big stick that's out to get us, and that somehow Jesus stepped in and, and almost dished out the cash to, to, to pay the price. That's not what the heart of this is. There's this amazing relationship. If we look at, throughout the balance of scripture, we have this amazing body that is the church. And Jesus loves her. He is the bridegroom and she is the bride. That's where us blokes have to get into our feminine side a little bit because we're a bride in this one. Yeah. Get in touch with being beautiful. <laughs> because that's how God sees us. He thinks we're gorgeous. really does. He thinks you're special. He thinks you're amazing. So much that he would sacrifice himself and say, Lord, I don't want to do this. This is going to hurt. But your will be done. Because I, I would do anything for her. I would sacrifice my life for her in order that she can be saved. That's the real good news. She's that important, you are that important to him, that he would give up everything. Trusting and knowing that his father had a purpose in that. And whenever we eat this bread, this broken body that he took upon himself. And every time we drink the cup, we will remember that death. It's power, it's strength, it's passion, it's love for us. But there's a hope that's beyond all hopes because he says, until he comes. He came back once immediately, and then this, this is written after the event, isn't it? So it's, it's, it speaks of his second coming in whatever way you want to unpack that one. I'm not going to get into eschatology right now. But let us just know with absolute certainty he's coming back. I had a wonderful teaching pastor. There were a lot of stuff that I'd, wasn't so wonderful in the church I was brought up in, but they were very, very good at teaching. And we once had a series uh, on the end time stuff and what happens when Jesus comes back. It, it was a, an hour 
Bible study once a week for eight weeks and we did all the different things, pre-millennial, post-millennial, amillennialists, dispensationalism, all these wonderful theological terms and we went through all the stuff for eight weeks and this, you know, the, the guy was brilliant, he, he had written books, he had done lots and lots of, you know, he was one of these guys that yeah, read, read the New Testament in Greek from, in, in his morning study, that's that kind of stuff. And, um, and he got to the end of it, at the end of week eight, he said, I'm now more confused than I was when I started. <laughs> <laughs> you need to know two things, he's coming back and you need to be ready. That's all the eschatology we really need. Because there are so many things that we don't understand. The, 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 the paradoxes and struggles and things in scripture, it's got to happen in a way that manages to fulfill all of it and not ignore any of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> and we don't know is the honest answer to so much of the stuff. We can hypothesize, we can have discussions, but it's not helpful to get ourselves down a rabbit hole in one direction, I believe. But we need to know he's coming back. And this declares it, doesn't it? Every time we eat this, we have this focus on him, remember him on the cross, his death, and he's coming back for his bride. That is one amazing wedding banquet to look forward to. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so let us take this together. But let us, before we do that, as this scripture encourages us to do, take a moment to examine ourselves. And just say, Lord, I want to do this right. I want to be a beautiful, beautiful part of your bride. Let's get it right. Anything that uh, is in the way right today, let's deal with it. Yeah, so just a moment of silence while we do that. He took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And he also took the cup and said, this is a new covenant. I'm looking forward to a new thing with you. This is a new hope, a new way forward. Whoever drinks it, do it in remembrance of me. Now, I'm going to be practical now. As you'll notice, there's not a load of little cups. What I want us to do, if we can, uh, I'll happily come and serve you if you can't. But uh, let's come up, break a bit of bread. We're going to get Anglican and dip it and take it. Oh, good idea. Okay? Mm -hmm. So please come when you're ready. The pale one in the middle is a non alcoholic one if you prefer. So, it's a good job I'm not actually Anglican because I'd have to finish it off. Wouldn't I? <laughs> 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 um, but instead of uh, having that in intoxication, let's just invite Holy Spirit to come and minister to us. Holy Spirit, come.
与未成年。One of the ways of reading this passage, and there are many,、um, is if in the past we've brought judgment on ourselves, we can get weak and sick at times、um, by not being obedient to the Lord's ways, and、um, this implies that we can break out of that. If we do actually spend time, as we have done, putting things right before the Lord, then I can declare in Jesus' name over us that we will not have that weakness and sickness. This goes in that incredible paradox, doesn't it? When we are weak at times and sick at times. Bit like, you know, can we know true love if we've never known what it is to be sad? Joy without pain. We kind of need one. Of, we we can't be on the mountain top the whole time.、Mm. Any journey has its ups and its downs, doesn't it? But we always seek to get to the place where we're in a good, good place, <laughs> in ourselves, in our spirit, and the way we carry ourselves in our body. That's all part of it, isn't it? And when we're in suffering, it is a really hard place to be. And the scripture does tell us to pray for those who are sick, in the hope that we see restoration. Um, Steve asked it earlier if we pray for him, and I will.、Um, I also promised、uh, you might have seen on the social channel、um, uh, Dan and Emma, Dan's、um, mothers, particularly unwell at the moment, back in hospital.、Um, and I said that we would together pray specifically for her.、Um, and I will just say to everybody else: if you want prayer for anything. Now is quite a good time to do it, isn't it? <laughs>、um, and we can do that for one another. Doesn't require ye oldy bloke up the front to do that. We are all priests, <coughs> aren't we? Or Peter, a royal priesthood, holy, belonging to God. Remember, you are holy ones. You are able to minister to one another. So we can do that together too. But I'd love to pray for Dan's mum first, because I promised that I would do that. So let's let's pray for her. That, that's honouring a passage in、um, James. Five fourteen. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't remember what it was for five or four. <laughs> What's interesting about that, though, before it says, "Ask God just to come and pray." It says, "Confess your sins to one another." And actually, the main thing that God wants to heal and sort out is the thin, the sin that has become hidden. And part of the healing is confessing sins and sharing them. Which is a humbling experience, isn't it? To <laughs> go, actually, this happened, and as this Corinthians passage implies, that sometimes that、uh, our physical and our spiritual is all mingled up together. So I encourage you to do that as well. If there's anything that is hindering us. I want to encourage you: grab a cuppa, have a chat, and maybe before you go, the next person you talk to, just say, 
how can I pray for you this week? Mm. Okay? And maybe even say, can I pray for you now? Before you go, let it be a room for prayer as we go on our own ways. Okay? Bless you. Amen.